tone, an orientation toward the world. When I was a beginning writer, tone was presented to us mostly as, you know it when you see it. It wasn't often a direct concern in workshop. In fact, the only time I've ever heard it defined by another fiction writer was in an aside, when, in the middle of talking about the middles of novels, Robert Boswell said one could consider tone the distance between the narrator and the character. This definition was useful to me because it offers a strategy through which a fictional tone can contradict the attitude of its characters. For example, comic novels with serious-minded protagonists. It is easy to see how a narrator who views the seriousness of the characters as funny can produce a comic effect. Morning, Louise. He's dead, Janet. The old man's dead. See, he wasn't breathing, and as cold as a fish. I touched him just to see. Janet. However, the distance between the narrator and the character is usually how we define psychic distance, which is different, but related. Psychic distance refers not to any difference of opinion between the narrator and the character, but to how close or far the narrator gets to the character's mind. In this way, psychic distance is one of many tools a writer can use to create tone, as are other tools like the sound or connotation of words, meter, rhythm, etc., even description, setting, characterization, plot. But none of these things by itself is what tone means to a story, what tone is. If we think about what tone does for fiction, it seems to offer a kind of lens through which to understand the attitudes of the characters toward each other and toward the world. Deadly serious characters may end up in a novel with a deadly serious tone, and they may also end up in a novel with a comic tone or something else. So our sense of what the tone is helps us figure out how to interpret them. Where does this sense come from? What is it that the author establishes via craft decisions? It is an orientation toward the world, the orientation of the implied author. The term implied author was coined in 1961 by Wayne Booth, who argued that a work of fiction is always rhetorical, that it involves authorial choices that establish an authorial persona. You can't find the real author in the text. And that ask readers to subordinate their real beliefs to the beliefs required by the text. For example, superpowers or space travel. The reader's second self, that is, the implied reader, is the one who experiences the characters as people. 
even if the real, in-the-flesh reader knows that they are made up. The author's second self, the implied author, is the version of the author that readers imagine from the authorial choices in the text. Orientation I am stealing from the dreaded Aristotle, who describes emotion as an orientation to the world. By toward, I want to suggest something less situational, to move from emotion to tone. What Aristotle is saying is that when we feel anger, for example, that anger is a register of our sudden perception of the world. We feel angry because we feel that the world is unjust. In fact, the anger typically arrives before the thought of injustice. The anger is your orientation to an unjust world. Where we part from Aristotle is in our current understanding that emotions are often cultural, not universal or instinctual. One famous example from anthropology is the emotion being a wild pig, which makes men in New Guinea steal things and run into the woods, only to remember nothing upon their return. This emotion is socially accepted and normal. It is also learned. In other words, an orientation toward the world does not originate in an individual, but in the world. What we consider unjust is shaped by shared values. Acquiring some of these virtues requires more than studying or the right amount of habituation. Certain external conditions must be present for their cultivation, external conditions that are often beyond the control of individuals. Perhaps the most important is that an individual is born into the right type of state. Aristotle argues that the state exists not for the purpose of allowing people to live, but for the purpose of allowing them to live well. And he also claims that one aim of the legislators is to make use of the laws to help improve the character of individuals. For our purposes as writers, the difference between tone and emotion is about an overall effect. Tone can last an entire story. Tone should not be mistaken for the protagonist's orientation toward the world, however, even for a first-person narrator. The protagonist might find the world to be a wonderful place, but the book might contradict her. The example of the comic novel with the serious narrator works only if it is clear that the book's orientation is different from the protagonist. Satire only works if it encourages the implied reader to read satirically. What you see are my notes on the story from teaching it several times and incorporating student comments. The story opens as a fairy tale opens with a routine establishing the status quo of the character's world, the status quo that will be broken by the occasion of the story. Ogechi's world so far has been trying to make delicate babies, babies she is not supposed to make. This is the primary value in her world, her ability to mother. We also learn things about her character, such as how she mothers and how her mother made her, and other things about the world, such as the logistics of baby making and the pressure on women to mother and on mothers with regard to class. The author establishes these values through specific details like the materials the babies are made out of. 
and through what the characters desire and through what Ogechi does for work and how she gets to work and even the quotation marks around apartment. In the beginning, we should see Ogechi is hopeful that she can overcome these pressures. The smug pride does a lot of work here to establish a difference between the way the implied author views the world, as matter of fact, as not so different from our world, perhaps a kind of satire of it, versus the way Ogechi views her world, as something she will overcome, though only to reinforce its values. Making babies. The end of the story finds Ogechi in a nightmare of her own making because of the pressures put upon her by the world. After destroying the baby, she resigns herself. She settles into her role, making a baby by society's rules. This is clear in the way she gives the baby her mother's face. The hope at the beginning of the story to feel a smug pride is gone. She has been incorporated into society. But are we supposed to share her resignation? The tone does not seem to suggest that we should. That's not the orientation toward the world that the implied author takes. Even the choice to include an otherwise throwaway phrase like she told herself separates Ogechi's orientation from the stories. The tone while not hopeful, also does not seem resigned. The world depicted here, which is of course our world, is a world the implied author stands against, even if, or because, Ogechi ends up accepting her place within it. What Tone tells us is that if fiction regularly presents a difficult world, it also indicates how to make sense of that world and for whom the world is difficult. Whether it is a good thing or not, fiction always says something about how we live, and not in an individual sense, in a contextual one. When we write fiction, we write the world. Even if that world looks almost the same as ours, it will always be a representation not a universal. If there is a distance tone inhabits, it is the distance between our world and the world of the story.